Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Andrew. And I'm Rachel. And we are Peak to the Sea Podcast. We are a true crime podcast aiming to put you, the listener, at the scene of the crime. We bring you a new episode on a weekly basis, mainly focusing on lesser known crimes from the UK and Ireland. However, at times, we expand into cases from anywhere in the world and all ones that are well known. And Rachel is actually an expert at those type of cases. So we're lucky to have her doing this. Oh, I like that title, expert. Might add that on my LinkedIn. Yes, you should do. <laughs> but as we are two kind podcasts, this of caution is always advised. And today, there is definitely no exception. Descriptions of torture and death will occur in this episode. So please be aware if they, those are trigger warnings for you. Thank you, as always, for the uh, heads up. If you like what you hear, please do follow us on whatever social media platform you prefer. Subscribe to us on your preferred podcast platform of choice. And if you have the capability, give us a rating and review as well. It does mean the world to us, doesn't it, Rach? Yeah, absolutely. We love our subscribers. We love our um, Patreons. We love our listeners. Yeah, we love everyone, don't we? There's so much love going around. Indeed. And if you like it that much that you want to support us, you can do so for less than the price of a cup of tea or coffee on Patreon with our lowest tier starting at £1 per month. We release bonus content every month. The links to our social medias and Patreon can be found in the show notes or visit patreon.com forward slash scenepod. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash s-c-e-n-e-p-o-d. We do, where possible, now release our episodes a week early for our Patreon supporters. Unlike Phil Connors in Groundhog Day, you don't need to turn from grumpy into happy to hear us a week in advance. All you have to do is support us on Patreon. And, well, we've got one extra supporter, Rachel, on Patreon. So we've got a new family member to Patreon. We definitely start, need to start thinking about a minibus. Hey, Selby D., who is a big friend of the podcast. She um, she wrote one of our scripts early on, which you she presented. Did. Yeah. Anyway. Congratulations on becoming a Patreon Hayes, because that's a big, big uh, thing for you. And and we absolutely love that you've joined the family. And we're going to, um, we definitely will have to invest in a minibus and we can take all of our Patreon supporters on a big family holiday or tour. Yes, and we could have, in a very true British format, we can have lashings of lemonade. Oh, lashings of lemonade. Sounds fabulous. I think we need some food with that, though. So, Rachel, are you ready for some true crime? You've not even asked how I am, Mr. O. Oh, I've been, oh look at that. I'm terrible. How are we Do doing, you know what, Rachel? Though? For the purpose of our listeners, we have spent the first half an hour of recording today catching up, so that's probably why. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that as a reason, um, even though I wrote this a week ago. Well, <laughs> but yeah, so. all good, thanks, Mr. O, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. It's Friday, happy days. Are you ready for some true crime? I absolutely am ready for some true crime. Very excited for this week. Great. Well, before I get started, though, unless you listen to us for the first time, you would have heard us mentioning the Murder Mouth True Crime podcast, produced by Mike. And I just want to recommend it one last time. He focuses on crimes from one square mile in London, usually older crimes, and the detail and production quality he puts into them means it's a worthwhile addition to your playlist. Yeah, it can be so hard for the independent pods who don't have tens of thousands to put in advertising and to get heard or discovered. So if you do want another podcast to listen to, I fully recommend Murder Mile too. Yes, so go listen to him. Right then, let's get started. This case I came across by accident, Rachel, and I found it fascinating. I think that says a lot about, like, you. Yes, probably. You're probably right there. Now, I've got a feeling it may well be really well known in true crime circles, because I stay away from new cases usually. You know me, Rachel. Uh, But this was new to me, so I thought I'd cover it. Now, if it turned out that there's been 200 other pods covered it already, then I apologise. But I don't think there has, because I would have maybe heard about it. This one also may be a little shorter than normal, depending on how much myself and Rachel talk about it, because she doesn't know what I'm about to present. But sometimes, you know, shorter stories need to be told as well, don't they? 
absolutely oh yeah and I was gonna say as well like how rare for you to take on what you well you're saying you don't you haven't heard of it that probably means that it is a well-known case because how many cases have I brought to the show that have been like they've had Netflix documentaries you know BBC like crime dramas based on them and you're like oh no I've not heard that before yeah that's a very good point so we've got Fred Rester no I'm only joking um (laughs) Oh, don't joke about him. Speaking of which, actually, I did want to say, and I'm sorry, it's such a long intro today. I did want to say that I got the opportunity to go and watch Makings of a Murderer. And I'll talk about it a bit more in the case that I'm presenting next week. But what an epic show. David is so insightful. Um, Great presentation. Like, I won't try and butcher the way he says murder there's been a murder but my god like what a man brilliant brilliant show and if anybody gets the opportunity to get to see him before he wraps his tour up go it's well worth the money very insightful very informative and a surprising amount of my friends and family are into true crime i find out from from attending that that show definitely and he's got a wonderfully shiny head as well yeah he does so if we say if you are to do so if you're still with his eyes, I'd like you to relax. Close your eyes and picture the scene. Today I'm taking you back to the 18th of February, 2022. And we're in Almond Grove in Wigan. On this day in question, we're in the afternoon. And while it was February, so the day gets dark early, it was still daylight. It'd been raining on and off throughout the day. With a temperature around 7 degrees Celsius, which is around 44 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, Almond Grove is a small residential street in the Worsley Hall Estate in Wigan. It was originally all social housing, but now it's a mixture of social and privately owned houses. Something that is quite common in the UK. Wigan itself is a large town in Greater Manchester, and it's got a population of just over 100,000 people, and it's located in the northwest of England. So, let me introduce you now, everyone to Christopher Hughes. Christopher, or Chris, as he was known by, and he preferred, so we'll call him that from now on. He was a 37-year-old man who used to be a boxer, but was now a proud dad to his four-year-old daughter. He was going through a bumpy patch in his life, Rachel. He was struggling with drug use, and he was trying to get a handle of life, but he was still a good person underneath it all. He was known as friendly, and he was someone who was always help would always help you if he could. It sounds like a nice guy. Mm. Chris was walking down Almond Grove when a blue Audi A4 came screeching to a halt next to him. When the car stopped, Curtis Balbus, who was 30 years old, and Erlan Sapu, who was 33, just jumped out of the car and they immediately started punching Chris until he fell to the ground. When he fell to the ground, they opened the boot and bundled him into it before closing it and speeding off. Martin Smith, who was 33, remained in the back of the car throughout. Oh, my God. And this was just in the middle of the afternoon? Yes, witnesses. Yes, there was witnesses to it. I've often thought, like, and you hear of this happening, like, with, like, vans, don't you? Just pulling up, taking somebody, kids getting, like, taken after school and stuff in broad daylight, like, being a bystander, what on earth must go through your head at that time? Like, especially, yeah. I imagine he put up a fight, like, or there was some sort of like screaming or, you know, just some alert to the fact that that was not normal behavior. Would you be thinking, oh, it's a prank, you know, that, that he's getting kidnapped for his like stag do or his birthday or something very innocent versus? You know, something a lot more sinister, which I'm I'm taking it. This is because we are a true crime podcast. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'd think. This, yeah, this was quite an efficient kidnapping though, Rachel. It only took a few seconds in total. So maybe the people didn't even have a chance to think. Maybe it was just there and over yeah, before they knew it. I guess yeah, they- and then... The next day, no, the police are appealing for witnesses of an altercation on this street on this day and time, and you think, bloody hell, I saw that. Yeah, I guess members of the public around that could see them, and in fact it was also reported 
by a witness, basically by more than one witness, I'll get onto one of them later on, that Chris could be heard shouting from inside the boot, why have you taken me? What are you doing? Mm. But this wasn't this wasn't a random kidnapping, no, Rachel. And it wasn't anything to do with drugs, because I know I mentioned he was struggling with drugs, so it wasn't anything to do with that. This was a targeted attack. They were looking for Chris specifically. So their search... So those three men I've already mentioned, Curtis, Erland, and Martin, mm-hmm. along with five other men, Razgar Kadar Mohammed, who was 40, Alan Jaff, who was 51, oh. Khalil Awala, who was 48, Dean Smeaton O'Neill Davy, who was 29, and Arion Volja, who was 20, 20 years old. The, the search began the previous evening all eight, with all eight men. And all eight men knew each other because they were either friends with each other or related to each other. What a broad age range as well, like from 20 to 50. Like, yeah. you know, to be, I, I'm using this term loosely, in a gang, I'm guessing. If they're on the hunt for someone, they could be called that, I don't know. But, um, you know, really broad age range. They're not, not messing there, are they? They've got some people that should know better, like, you know, in contained in the group. like. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think, I think you can call them a gang, because it's a gang of men, isn't it? Right, so the previous evening, the men had been driving around the Wolvesley Hall Estate lucky for Chris. And they even turned up at his own home, Rachel, and they forced themselves into his house to try to find him. And they didn't find him that evening, but obviously they did the next day, because we just spoke about them grabbing him. So... Why do you think they were lucky for him? And do you know this case, Rachel, or can you have a guess if you don't? No, I I must admit, I don't know the case, despite taking the mick out of you earlier. Um, If they are brash enough to burst into his home, I'm assuming he must have lived with his daughter, potentially, and maybe a partner or parents even. His mum, I think. His mum, right. Okay, so, you know, They've got some intent on on getting him, haven't they? Because th- they're going to be caught on camera. There's going to be people that can, like, attest to who they are, give witness statements. You know, I I just thought when they were going to pull him off the streets, people would just be able to get a number plate of a van and not really know much else about the people that took him. But yeah, these people are quite brash, and they must have had a real reason to be hunting him down. But I can't think why that might be. But a few days earlier, and the exact date was never revealed, or I couldn't find it at least, a teenage girl had raped Rachel <gasps> at, at Knife Point behind a post office close by. And these eight men collectively believed that Chris had raped a girl and that they had enough proof to put it beyond doubt. So they so were, they were yeah. taking the law into their own hands. Like, had yeah. they. Was there a. Was he potentially like quoted in the press as a person of interest, maybe? Or well, we'll we'll get onto that. But um, okay, sorry. But yeah, so it was. Well, the rape wasn't anything that was widely publicized, so it wasn't like mm-hmm. in the papers or anything like that. Um, but so, but yeah, you're right. So the reason they were looking for him was to exact justice on him, and what proof they had. Well, I'm going to touch on that a little bit later, if that's okay, Rachel. Yeah. So Chris knew they were looking for him because, well, it's after they searched his house illegally the night before because obviously then you're going to be like, you're going to get told someone's to looking at the gang of men looking for you. Yeah. And he'd actually told the fr- his friends the day of his kidnap that he had nothing to do with him and he didn't do it and he don't know he didn't know why they were looking for him. Imagine, imagine having that conversation with your friends, by the way, you know, that gang that's looking for me, I've got nothing to do with this girl's rape. So just so you know, like, Oh, I couldn't even imagine having to have those conversations. I know. And with with Chris in the boot of the car, they drove off to the Skelmersdale area, White Moss Road South to be exact, which is about eight miles from where they snatched him. So a 16-minute drive, probably a bit quicker because reports were that they were speeding. When they got to the White Moss Road South area, and it was a little bit of a rural area, it is believed that all eight men took Chris out of the boot of the car to exact revenge on behalf of the teenage girl that had been raped. So, yeah, when they was at that destination and they took him out of the boot of the car, the first thing they did, Rachel, was they immediately cut the tendon 
on one of his legs so that he couldn't walk or run away. Oh my goodness me! That like they're setting the intent of the of the brutality, aren't they? Yes. It, well, I, I it's no surprise they, they killed him, but yeah. Um, oh so when Chris's body was examined, it showed that there was at least one knife and one machete used on him. They thought they think it was more, but they could only like clearly say there was at least one ma- knife and one machete using him. And they proceeded to torture Chris in several ways. The defensive wounds that he had in his body shows that he did put up quite a fight. I remember, he used to be a boxer. Yeah, yeah. But he was against several armed men, eight to be exact, with weapons and a cut tendon in his bottom of his leg. So he had no chance of escape, really. Although he, the defensive room showed that he put up a, quite a big, like, defense and fight. But yeah, he was gonna, it was gonna be over, overpowered. And I can imagine because of what they're accusing him of, they tortured him as well. This wasn't just a, a quick like beating and and killing. It was it was probably prolonged as well. Exactly. Well, they they held him down, and they took his trousers and underwear off him, Rachel. They then held his legs open, and they proceeded to. I'm not going to go into detail here, but they proceeded to intentionally injure him causing him untold pain in his groin region, using, again, at least one knife and one machete. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm sorry if you want more detail, people, but it's out there if you want it. I'm not going into it. Use your imagination. But by the time they had finished, Chris had at least 90 sharp instrument injuries on him. That means he had been stabbed with a knife or hit with a machete at least 90 times. Well, it was actually a little bit over, but at least 90 times. So he was truly tortured, Rachel. Yeah, and a machete as well. That's just the yeah. level of brutality. It's not just a kitchen knife. They've gone out of their way to really, you know, inflict, like, an obscene level of pain on this person. I feel feel for him. Like, uh-huh. I mean, obviously he's protesting his innocence, I can only assume he was innocent because, you know, you've made a, um, a point of of attesting to that, that like for absolutely no reason whatsoever, this this man has been tortured to death. And these people like have been, um, you know, tried to take law into their own hands, like, and there's just no need for it. And, and this is exactly why people shouldn't, um, you know, try. And there's a word for them, isn't there? Uh, what are they called? Um, my memory's... Vigilante. Vigilante is, yeah. Um, and this is exactly the wrong reason for it because they're ill informed and they're reacting to, you know, word on the street, gossip, and um quite often innocent people get caught up in it. Definitely. Well, I, I will say that earlier I said I'll touch on the proof that they thought they had. So um let's, okay. put, let's put a bookmark in there because maybe they did have some proof. But once he was dead, the eight men left. And were joined later that evening by a ninth man, Andreas Oskaratis, who was a 27-year-old Ukrainian, and they formed a burial party in order to get rid of Chris's body. And I'm calling it a burial party because that's what they called it themselves. So it's not me being uh, or the press, press being flowery of language. Yeah, they actually called it a burial party. So they got some of their partners to go out and buy bleach bin bags, shovels and rubber gloves, most of which was from a nearby Asda, along with other equipment to help them. So they immediately showed that they were forensically aware, aware. That, they, that they needed it, and also to get their wives and girlfriends to buy the stuff, so it wasn't them on CCTV buying it. Yeah, it's very uh, crafty, isn't it? But to to bring their wives and girlfriends into the loop, I mean thinking that they would get away with it and and not bring them down with them like yeah. i wonder whether any of the wives or girlfriends like protested or said what the hell i mean you would if you had somebody saying to you can you get me some ropes and bags and bleach and some rubber gloves you'd be thinking what the fuck have you done sorry for my language no that's okay you you're right yeah and they were going to bury his body in wasteland around a place where they killed him white moss road south but as they started to dig a grave that, that evening, that night time for Chris's body, 
Andreas, the Ukrainian, who had joined him that evening and was acting as a lookout, he signaled to them that there was a heavy police presence beginning to develop in the area. So they abandoned plans to bury Chris and they left his body at the bottom of an embankment on White Moss Road South. Oh, so what in like broad daylight for people to. Well, no, what is he? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And. So the police presence actually wasn't for them, Rachel. It was just a coinc- coincidental because there'd been a crash, a semi-serious road accident nearby at the same time. And so the police, they even interviewed one of the men, Dean Smeaton o- O'Neill Davey, while he was in his full burial kit, where they used gloves, etc. But they interviewed him to see if he'd been a witness to the accident that had occurred. And when they determined that he hadn't, they let him go. Oh, well, I bet he was bricking it. Yeah, yeah, you would be, wouldn't you? But, okay, but now I can understand why they've just left him in broad daylight because yeah. they were thinking they were the police were on the hunt for them. Andreas was then charged with by the group the task of destroying a blue Audi used in a kidnap and murder, and also destroying CCTV evidence that could link them to the crime. The rest of the gang took steps to destroy clothes and mobile phones to try to prevent them from ever being caught for the vile crime. That, just, that they had just committed. Four days later, Rachel, a man walking his dog. And you know, Rachel, I think I'm in my household, I'm the one who walks our dog probably 90, 95% of the time. And I really do dread what I might find one day. But four days later, on a cold, snowy day, a dog walker discovered Chris's body at the bod- bottom of that embankment where it had been since it was discarded so easily by the gang of men. It's always dog walkers, isn't it? Yeah, I know, it is. And I wonder as well, like, whether police look after um, the witnesses that, that discovered the bodies. Like, And what I mean by look after is make sure they get home okay and then, you know, follow up with some sort of, like, post incident like review if they're suffering with PTSD or you know flashbacks nerves you know I I, I can imagine some of the states these bodies are found in the, the people that have to call them in are um are terrified yeah I, I'd hope that the police do I've got a feeling they probably don't do that much but I, I don't know actually if you, if you people out there know let us know, yeah. but you'd hope that they do, but I fear that they probably don't. Yeah. So the police, though, talking about the police, Rachel, they did show some excellent investigative skills trying to piece together what happened to Chris. Firstly, they heard about the claims that he had raped a teenager. So you, you, you touched on it earlier, so let's put this matter to bed, shall we? There was no evidence whatsoever that Chris committed a rape. He was never suspect. And actually, semen taken from the victim turned out at a later date not to be a match to Chris. So he couldn't have done it. it oh. Like it was, it was impossible. Not unless two people were able to go, and she didn't know. So the whole reasoning for doing it in the first place, it was flawed and invalid. And actually, it's not like it would have been a valid reason anyway, even if he had have committed a rape. But I want to touch on that a little bit later at the end. But yeah, no, there was no evidence whatsoever. And when the forensic test came back, after he was dead, that the test came back, yeah, it wasn't even his semen. So there's no way it could have been him. They they then managed to, by piecing together many, many hours from dozens of CCTV recordings, obviously excluding the ones that had been deleted, identify the eight men who committed the murder the ones they named earlier, and also they identified two who helped dispose of evidence, Andreas, who I mentioned, and also and Michael Gibbons. The evidence they found was recovered mobile phone messages between the people, talking about looking for him, talking about catching him, and then afterwards arranging the burial party, and then finally dispose of evidence. How often do you hear that it's the mobile phones that give people up. Like, yeah. you know, they're forensically aware, they're conscious of CCTV, um, they're finding 
places to bury the body where you know hopefully for them it won't be found for a long time but yeah they're still conversing over whatsapp or iMessage about like right i'll meet you in this car we'll take him from there we'll do this there and then we'll all meet and bury him well that was actually the good work by the police because they actually thought they'd got rid of both the messages on the phone and the phones and the police managed to recover the messages I don't know if it was from the cloud or they found the phone and then managed to find it. They didn't actually say, but they actually, and that's what Andreas's task, getting rid of everything. So they thought that they were safe and the phones had been gone, but it's never, nothing's ever deleted fully, is it? No, absolutely not. Not in this day and age. So in a mysterious cloud. They were still able to trace the majority of the people accused by CCTV and they had enough evidence for Rachel to take the case to trial. Oh, so they Amazing. thought. So in October of that year, a lengthy trial will start. One that will take almost four months to complete, which is quite a long time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And when it was concluded, it would also take the jury 34 hours to come to a conclusion, which again is a reasonable amount of time. Quite often it's quite short, yeah. Just before the trial started, Curtis Balbis, if you remember him, he was in the car, he would change his plea to guilty but the rest of the defendants would plead not guilty. Erlen Sapu would admit to being in the car when Chris was kidnapped, but he claimed he got out of the car once he was put into the boot and he left while Curtis drove off with him in the boot. Erlen would testify that he could hear Chris pleading from within the boot, saying over and over, what have I done wrong? I mean, if he knew enough to tell his friends that he wasn't involved in the rape, there must have been something in the back of his mind that thought these seven men were accusing him of that. Yeah, maybe he's just in a panic and he's like, maybe he's just trying to get them to start a conversation so they say, you raped her, and then he's like, no, I didn't. Then he can defend, yeah. I guess if he went straight into defence, he'd be like, oh, that's what any rapist is going to say. Yeah. And actually, do you know what, like, Chris saying he got out of the car. And I'm just going to throw this out here. From my childhood, well, I was about 17 or 18, I had a few friends who kidnapped someone. And I'm going to tell the story because I'm not going to mention the names. Basically, um, one of the... I wasn't involved at all. I found it after the fact. I One of the um, men had a girlfriend at the time who had a baby. Yeah. And they split up, and she started seeing someone else. And so him and a couple of his friends were driving down the road, and they saw this guy who she was seeing. So they grabbed him and kidnapped him and took him to some woods. And they tied him up, and they threatened him. But then, like... It always made me smile because I just thought, like, this is why they should never do it in the first place. Well, they should never do it in the first place anyway, but they just weren't made out of it because they weren't, like, hardened criminals or anything like that. They then loosened his hands as they threatened him and even gave him the bus fare to get home. What? So, yeah, so then what happened was the police obviously arrested all three of them. Two of them, the guy who had a girlfriend in the first place and one of his friends... Just denied everything, like no comment, denied everything. The police are no evidence, really. So they got away with everything. Uh, no charges, didn't even get taken to court. One of them immediately just said everything, like, admitted to everything in the interview. And that's the only evidence that they had against him. The fact that he sat there and admitted it, even though they had no evidence. So they sent him to prison. And um, and I just remember thinking, like, because he went to um, open prison, the one in Lincolnshire. So it wasn't like, um, anything too harsh and I spoke to him afterwards and I was like if you'd have just like said nothing they wouldn't have um wouldn't wouldn't have even gone to trial and now I know obviously um it's wrong to kidnap someone but I think this from what I could gather this was probably the nicest kidnap you could have yeah, I was going to say it was a very yeah. friendly shakedown afterwards, giving him bus fare yeah. to get home. Yeah, untying him, giving him his bus fare, and just letting him get off. But but it just, it just, it's just like I'm, I'm touching on that because in their minds they've got rid of all the evidence. So Curtis turning around and changing his plea to guilty 
and the rest of them pleaded not guilty. It just made me remember about that, and I was thinking, like, is Curtis going to be the only one that gets sent to jail or not? Shall we see? Yeah, and what I would say, though, is at the end of the day, like, regardless of the friendly aspect of this shakedown or the brutality of the the one that we're discussing in the podcast, like, somebody's life at some point has been put on the line and you, yes. you, your man that was kidnapped, even though he was then given bus fare and told to get off on his way, he didn't know how that was going to pan out. And, like, ultimately, people do need to be punished for behaving in that way and putting others through that because I think even like a trauma that lasts like 30 seconds can have a lasting impact on the rest of your life like do you go to the local shop again on your own do you ever brave getting public transport do you ever step foot out of the house again do you know like the these kind of like lasting impacts that these in these like interactions have on on individuals like someone definitely does need to be punished for them oh no i agree completely and i'm sorry people if you thought i was just saying that they shouldn't have been punished for it obviously all three of them should have been punished but yeah no i, I agree completely with you rachel yeah. you just yeah and that's not how it came across at all uh it didn't co- come across like that but more just like you know whether whether or not you maim someone you know or or, or have a threat to kill you have you know like worst case scenario like ruined their mental well-being yes um, sorry best case scenario best case scenario no i get you yeah i get you and that punishment should be by the rule of law but yeah. um so yeah with with curtis pleading guilty so we obviously know he's guilty because he got found guilty because he's he pled guilty so no trial but here are the verdicts for the rest of the men tried. All of these were unanimous verdicts by the jury of eight men and four women for every single person. So while it may have taken them a while to get to the conclusions, they did all agree. Mm. So let's start with Michael Gibbons, who was charged with two counts of perversion the course of justice. He would be found not guilty of both charges and would be free to go. Wow. Let's then go on to Andreas Uskaratis, who would be found not guilty of murder, not guilty of kidnapping, but guilty of assisting an offender, Curtis Balbus, and he would receive six years in prison. Wow. Six, a six-year sentence. Curtis Balbus, who we I just mentioned pled guilty, would get life with a minimum term of 34 years. Wow. So the rest of the defendants, they would all be found guilty of both murder and kidnapping, and they would receive the following life terms. Erlen Sapu would get 35 years minimum. Martin Smith would get 33 years minimum. Rasgar Kadar Mohammed would get 27 years minimum. How on earth they got less... Sorry. Oh, no, no, carry on. How on earth they got less sentences when they tried to get away with murder? And plead not guilty. Well, I'll I'll tell you why after I've told you sentences, but that's a very good okay. question because I asked myself that uh, Alan Jaff and Kalau Aula would get twenty six years minimum. Dean Smith and O'Neill Davy would get twenty five years min twenty five years minimum, and finally, Arian Roger would get twenty three years minimum. The judge, in his sentencing remarks, would go on to say that the attack was not only brutal but sadistic. And the judge would say this. I can only conclude those injuries were thought to be suitable punishment for someone suspected of having committed a sexual offence. They would have been, for Mr Hughes, both humiliating and painful. He would go on to say that he accepted that they all believed the girl's allegations that it was Chris who raped her. But even if he had, which he didn't, it did not justify the attack on him. He said that the three men who all got over 30 years quite obviously intended to kill Chris. So there was no other outcome. So the starting point for sentencing would be 30 years for those. But the three had previous violent convictions, um, which was was an aggravating factor. And also they threatened a witness, one of the witnesses who saw him being put into the boot, 
not to say mm-hmm. anything. So they received more than a 30-year starting point because they had aggravating factors. And just, so, just let me clarify, I found conflicts in things on this. What I believe, and I could be wrong, the, the judge meant by they believed the girl's allegations that it was Chris. I, from what I can gather, the girl didn't actually say it was Chris who raped her. It was Chinese whispers. So by the time it got to these men, it was, well, the girl said it was Chris who raped her. Um, that's the proof that they thought they had. Uh, to on what I said earlier. So I'm not, from what I can gather, the, the girl didn't say it was, she didn't lie and say it was Chris who raped me. It was just Chinese whispers. And by the time it got to them, it was her saying it was Chris who raped me. Yeah. And how often do you see that in small villages, communities, towns? You know, hearsay, somebody starts off with, you know, it was it was a white male in his 30s. Somebody then throws in a name and all of a sudden there's a suspect. Like, yes. And it's, you know, even the profile is completely incorrect. Um, but because that process has started and people are talking, you can't, can't undo that. Exactly. And he said that he sentenced the remaining people who got less than 30 years on the basis that they intended to cause grievous bodily harm at the least, but then it turned into murder. So their starting point was 20 years each. So they all got actually higher than the starting point, but less than the starting point of 30 years. Yeah, and I would actually say in this case that um, there was justice for Chris's family um, with those sentences. None of them, you know, they are life-changing sentences. Yes. For those men, some of which will come out very elderly men, um, if yeah, or if at all, um, and that that is the right thing because when you're sentenced for taking someone's life, a portion of your life should be spent behind bars, and yes. um, and you know, obviously being rehabilitated. That's my belief anyway, but it definitely needs to be a portion of your life that is taken away from you. Um, Yeah, I do think that the sentences that were passed down were proportionate to the the crime. Yeah, definitely. And so, yeah. And so here we have it, Rachel. It's a short one and normal, but one that will surely spark a debate among us and also our listeners. Now, I personally believe in the rule of law. I know we've had feedback and reviews before when I've said this, and they said that we were naive and looking at things too simplistically. But I seek by my beliefs, Rachel. I I know it's hard if you're a family member of a victim or survivor, but I just don't believe in vigilantism. And we have the rule of law in the UK and in most countries. If a law is deemed to be missing or wrong, there are ways and means of getting those laws changed. But by committing violence or murder against another, no matter how horrible their crime is, then I'm sorry to say, but in my opinion, I think it simply makes you the same as the person that you're looking to punish. Now, Violence is not the answer. Exactly. Now, Chris Hughes, he was a good man. And he was a good man who had simply fallen on hard times. But still, he was a good man. Now, several men decided that they were the law and they killed and they tortured him because they thought he was right and well we'll never know this Rachel so this is my opinion I am like 100% certain that at the time they were doing it they were really enjoying it Mm. because they were getting a buzz out of it because how else can you commit such a crime and stab or cut someone over 90 times holding someone's legs open so they could get at the groin easier and torture and hurt someone. Yeah. And then we've also got to think, Rachel, there's a four-year-old girl now without a father. There's yeah. a mother without a son. And let's think about the families of the killers as well. Their lives have changed forever. But then finally, let's think about that rape, rape victim too. She'll always be known by some as a girl who got Chris killed, even though she had nothing to do with it. And it was never confirmed she actually said it was him. And from what I can gather, she didn't. It doesn't matter. 
if she said that or not now, because people will believe that she did say that. So, so someone who is a victim of a horrible crime and rape is a, one of the worst crimes out there, Rachel. She's now going to be punished for her actions in different ways. And they killed Chris. And in reality, the person who they thought they were defending, who they were doing it for, is now going to be punished even more by people's reactions and how they interact with her. And maybe almost making her a social prior by, by some people. So it's just all these knock-on effects. So yeah, it's a short one and normal, but I just thought this had to be told because so people can see the consequences of thinking that they can take things into their own hands. You see these like websites, like um, I'm not going to name them because I don't give them publicity, but they promote being a vigilante and taking laws into their own hands. And they film stuff and stuff like that. And it's just it's just nonsense. So bad as the people who committed the crimes. And what do you think of this one then, Rachel? It's an incredibly upsetting story. And uh, I, I I like the fact that, you know, you ended. I, I won't go back and make comments on what you've mentioned about the murderers because, uh, you know, we can put that to bed and we can end the, the story by, like, remembering absolutely that he had a four-year-old daughter who's left with that father a mother who's left without a son, a community that's left without, like, someone uh, who is just trying to better themselves and, like you say, you know, get over, uh, you know, the recent hard times and just incredibly sad. It is incredibly sad. So let me wrap this up then, Rachel. This has been Season 3, Episode 4, called The Burial Party. And if it's safe you to do so, and I call you to relax. Close your eyes and picture the scene. So the truly horrible criminals out there, Rachel, the violent ones, the sexual offenders, the killers, the only one thing that they have in common, really, is that they don't have empathy. They don't see what they're doing is wrong at all. And a lot of them quite enjoy it. Now let's think about the vigilante groups that exist. They enjoy what they do, even though it's illegal. They enjoy being judge, jury, and in some instances like this, executioner. This gang enjoyed torturing Chris. So let me ask you and everyone out there, what's, what exactly is the difference between these two groups of people? And I think that silence by Rachel, you can't see her shaking her head, says everything. So thank you, everyone, for listening to this. We appreciate you, as always. If you want to comment on this, you can do on any of our social media posts or reaching out to us directly. We'll happily discuss this with you. And yeah, if you disagree with us, let us know. Please do get in touch, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, and stay happy. Stay happy. Bye. Bye.